Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we are back with the Pacific War Part 2. And yes, this is made by Kings and Generals. And the title of this video is going to be Japanese Invasion of Malaya. So we all know Malaya is, it's Malaysia. And yeah, so if you, did, if you hadn't seen my first part of my reaction is going to be in the description down below check it out because you if you're gonna watch this you're not going to understand it so yeah so i'm going to start my recording two thousand years later okay so here we go guys like and subscribe oh whoa, whoa, whoa. okay i'm sorry about that here we go like and subscribe let's get right to it Okay, I'm gonna just fix my, I'm sorry, very sorry, I'm just fixing my audio and let's go. Pacific War, ooh, 1941 to 1945. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th would always be remembered as the day of infamy in which the Japanese started the Pacific War. But at the same time, the Empire of Japan also began simultaneous offensives against British, Dutch and American possessions in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Today we're going to cover some of these attacks in mainland Southeast Asia, primarily focusing on the invasion of Malaya and the British response against the Japanese aggression. Learning about the sponsor of this video, Boxu, was one of the um, highlights. I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry. Uh, I gotta skip the... With the rise of the Japanese threat after the end of World War I, the UK had decided to establish a main naval base in Singapore during the 20s to defend their colonial possessions in the Far East. Singapore was selected due to its strategic importance and because it was the only British territory to be excluded from the non-fortification clause of the Washington Naval Treaty. Oh yeah, by the way, this is the time where British is still in Indian soil and India, Pakistan and Bangladesh and even Myanmar, Bhutan and Nepal is still part of the British Empire. So yeah, the British Empire is still huge in this type of time. So yeah. I've tapped time times. And their intention was to have a strong fleet here to deter Japan from any act of war. But this was clearly not enough, as Japanese aggression in the region during the 30s kept rising and threatening the British colonies. The outbreak of the Second World War in Europe also limited the capability of the UK to defend this region, leaving British Malaya, Burma and Hong Kong alone in case of war with Japan. Prime Minister Winston Churchill himself believed that the Japanese wouldn't dare to attack them as early as 1941, so he chose to reinforce the Mediterranean instead. In case of attack, however, the British plan of defense consisted of delaying the Japanese advance as long as possible while maintaining control over their fortress at Singapore for the arrival of reinforcements to save them, even though they actually couldn't afford to send reinforcements to the Far East. So this plan was very unrealistic. Oh. In Malaya, Commander-in-Chief Robert Brooke Popham of the British Far East Command had been assigned the defense of the region, although he knew that without reinforcements, they wouldn't be able to withstand a Japanese attack. Malaysian ground forces were under the command of Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, who only had 31 inexperienced infantry battalions, untrained to fight in jungles and rubber plantations, which were organized into three divisions and with the Malaysian garrisons totaled some 88,600 men. Air power was also key for the defense of Malaya, but the British only counted with 14 squadrons of mostly old aircraft, a small ah. force to cover both strike and reconnaissance roles. Naval forces were old and small as well, but they would be reinforced by Admiral Tom Phillips' Force Z consisting of the battleships Prince of Wales and Repulse, along with four destroyers, mainly intending to deter any act of Japanese aggression. 
The British government also believed that Hong Kong couldn't be defended because of the strong Japanese presence all around it. But Major General Christopher Maltby thought that he could at least delay the Japanese advance long enough to be rescued by British reinforcements, even though there were none available. Ah, he then okay. placed three infantry battalions at the Gin Drinkers Line, a defensive line that stretched across the Kowloon Peninsula, intending to stop the Japanese advance in the mainland, while three more battalions with a volunteer corps held Hong Kong itself. On November 11th, 1940, the German raider Atlantis captured the British steamer Automedon in the Indian Ocean. The ship was carrying papers meant for Air Marshal Sir Robert Brooke Popham. The information was about the weakness of the Singapore base, and in ah. December 1940, the Germans handed this information over to the Japanese. Because we all know Japanese, the Italians and the Germans are allies in the war, so yeah. Alongside this, the Japanese broke the British Army codes in January 1941, learning the details of the weakened state of the Fortress of Singapore, allowing them to prepare for an invasion. As we've already seen, after the embargo enacted by the US, the UK and the Dutch in July of 1941, the Japanese had decided to simultaneously invade their possessions in the East to get their hands on the rich resources they possessed. It is interesting to note that as China tied down many of their forces, the Japanese could only employ 11 divisions for these offensives, so speed was really of the essence before the Allies could reinforce this region. By late November, preparations for the attacks had already been carried out, and on December 2nd, the order to climb Mount Niteka had been sent, setting in motion the start of the offensives. For the invasion of Malaya, the Japanese planned to do several naval landings in southern Thailand and northern Malaya, followed by an advance through the Malayan Peninsula along the western coastal plain until the final assault against Singapore ah. across the Strait of Johor. First of all, Thailand is very out of place. Thailand is the only... Um, independent nation in in whole asia in this part geez okay china is still but i don't know if that's independent because japanese is in your land and philippines is being held by america and malaysia is being held by the british and india myanmar bhutan nepal Bangladesh and Pakistan is still colonies of the British Empire so yeah the Thailand is very very out of place and it's this is my first time knowing that Thailand was a kingdom the plan developed by Suji Masanobu was very bold having to traverse 400 miles of jungle road against a major force that had established formidable defenses in Singapore the 25th Army of Lieutenant General Yamashita Tomoyuki, initially consisting of two divisions, was appointed to execute this operation, covered by the second fleet of Admiral Kondor Nobutake in its role of escorting convoys to Thailand and Malaya. The landings at Thailand would be critical because the British couldn't defend this area, giving the Japanese an easy landing point to commence their advance. Thailand. Oh. What's this? What the hell? Oh, they didn't play. <laughs> well, that was weird. That was very, very weird. Yo! Oh, yeah, Thailand's dictator, Marshal Plek Fibun, had promised the Japanese to allow them safe passage for a possible invasion of Malaya. Ah, Yet at the same them. time, he was negotiating with the British and Americans for guarantees, which made the Japanese feel like they couldn't trust him. So, you're allowing them to pass by your country and... And... Wait, so you're... Okay, that's very, very stupid of you because you're... Um, allowing Japanese to pass by your country 
and meanwhile you're negotiating like guarantees with American the British why that's that that's stupid like Japanese is like strong at this time so yeah even now the 15th Army of Lieutenant General Ida Sojiro, initially composed of two divisions, also needed to transit through Thailand, as it had been prepared for an invasion of Burma. Uh. If the Thais didn't allow the Japanese safe passage by December 7th, then this army would invade from Indochina and head straight to the Burmese border. To counter a possible invasion of Thailand, Brooke Popham had planned for the 11th Indian Division to establish positions at Singora and Patani before the Japanese could land, although this action meant invading a neutral nation. Since Operation Matador didn't get automatic approval, the plan was essentially dead, but it would have one major consequence. The 11th would be prevented from completing defensive positions at Jitra. And at Hong Kong, the 23rd Army of Lieutenant General Sakai Takeshi consisting of only one division, had the task of executing a three-pronged attack against the Gin Drinkers Line, while Hong Kong Island itself was blockaded and bombarded into submission. Oh. On December 4th, troop transports from Hainan Island, escorted by Admiral Kondo's fleet, started to sail en route to their objectives. Two days later, the Japanese were spotted by British reconnaissance, but Brooke Popham wasn't authorized to take any actions yet, only putting his forces on full alert. At 2300 hours on December 7th, the Japanese presented an ultimatum to the Thai government, demanding safe passage and giving them two hours to respond. As Fibun couldn't be located until late morning, the Thais would be invaded some hours later. Ah. Oh. Backstabbing. From Indochina, <laughs> the Imperial Guards Division and the 55th Division invaded Phra Tabong unopposed, then continuing northwest towards Aranya Prathet. Meanwhile, a regiment of the 5th Division had landed at Patani, and the rest of the division landed at Singora, quickly oh. taking the upper hand against the fierce Thai defenders. From Saigon, elements of the 15th Army would also execute some naval landings across Thailand but they would face staunch Thai resistance that would prevent them from making any progress. At the same time, almost an hour before the attack on Pearl Harbor began, the 18th Division landed at Kota Baru with much effort, quickly oh, wow. running into beach defenses held by an Indian battalion. In response, oh. the defenders employed their artillery and their Hudsons to bombard the Japanese positions while the men in the pillboxes pinned down waves of enemy soldiers, thus inflicting heavy casualties on the invaders. After heavy combat, the Japanese finally penetrated the center of the Indian line by 0345. Imagine India fighting in a war for, f for other countries' freedom, while they are getting colonized by another nation and they're still not free oh my god okay if you don't know how i learned that it's in my india and pakistan a continuing story reaction series so if you want to see that see the first part of that go check out in the description down below but this kind of looks like it's d-day it for me for me it kind of looks like it's d-day because the way you know it's a beach threatening the valuable Attack. airfield nearby. Concurrently, 17 Japanese bombers attacked Singapore, only causing minor damage to their airfields and killing 61 persons. Yet this was a shock to the British command, who didn't believe that their foe had access to long-range aircraft. Japanese fighters and bombers also started to appear in Kotobaru and across the main airfields of northern Malaya, causing havoc on Brook Popham's RAF and proving their air superiority that's the reason why you have to be you have to um um think about your next defense and you have to think what circumstances is going to be um what if what if um japanese have these what if japanese have that like you have to be prepared for what's gonna happen like yeah 
Then look. Well, look what happened. Yeah. In the ensuing confusion, two counterattacks by different Indian battalions were repelled at Kotabaru, prompting the British to prematurely destroy their northern airfields to prevent them from falling into enemy hands. While at night, the defenders at last retreated from the beaches to guard Kotabaru itself. And further west, uh -huh. a small Indian force, based at the town of Crow, had been earmarked to execute a mini Operation Matador, codenamed uh. Krokol, with the objective of occupying the easily defendable ledged position on the Patani Road. While confusion reigned at the British headquarters, Operation Krokol was launched at 1500. After crossing the frontier, however, the Indians were met by staunch Thai resistance from the police based in the town of Betong. These policemen, led by Major Prayun Ratanakit, established important roadblocks that managed to delay the Indian advance for two whole days. That's a problem. While at the same That's a huge problem. Because they have to go here because to, to help the the two um I don't know division. Was it a division? Um brigade, yeah, sorry, it's a, it's a brigade. To help those two brigade, but they were just stopped by police. Same time fighting the Japanese at Patani. After several hours of fighting, Japan and Thailand signed an armistice by midday, with Fibun finally allowing Japan to use his country as a base of operations, although the Thais would not join the war effort for now. Unopposed, but traversing over bad roads, the Japanese at Patani would also start to advance to the ledge position that was some 60 miles away from them, starting a race with the Krokol detachment to get there first. Meanwhile at Hong Kong, three columns of the 38th Division commenced their attack, quickly overrunning British defences in the new territories and reaching the Gin Drinkers Line by late afternoon. The British colony was also subjected to a heavy air bombardment and a naval blockade by Vice Admiral Nimi Masaichi's 2nd China Fleet. They weren't expecting that. So yeah, that's a big problem for not learning what an enemy can do so yeah. although two british destroyers managed to escape the encirclement at 2130 to join force z at singapore yeah that's the reason why you have to prepare for what's gonna happen because what there's a lot of things that can happen it could it could be bad it could be good hey it's life but unbeknownst to them admiral phillips had already sailed from singapore after dark intending to intercept the Japanese invasion fleet in the South China Sea. He expected to arrive at Kotabaru on December 10th, and he relied on the surprise factor for the success of his operation. The following day started with renewed fighting at Kotabaru. As the Japanese pressed on the disorganized defenders, they began to infiltrate around the British strongpoints, something so worrisome for the British command that on December 10th, the defenders were authorized to abandon Kotabaru and retreat south of Machang. Oh my god. Okay. At 13.45 on December 9th, Force Z was also discovered by Japanese submarines while they traveled ah. north, so their destruction was now inevitable. Four hours later, the British spotted Japanese aircraft tailing them, prompting Phillips to turn west and return to Singapore. While the British fled to the south, fate would intervene at midnight, as Force Z received erroneous reports that Kuantan was suffering naval landings. Phillips then decided to investigate this critical location, changing his course to the southwest. When he arrived at 0800, he found no sign of the enemy, so he decided to linger off Kuantan for an extra 90 minutes. This ah. would prove fatal, as Japanese bombers and torpedo planes soon fell upon them. Several attacks were made against the British battleships by midday, with one bomb hit on the Repulse and two torpedo hits on the Prince of Wales that caused considerable damage. A new attack at 12.20 managed to hit the Repulse with four torpedoes, leaving it unable to maneuver and exposed to five more hits that caused her to list and finally sink ten minutes later. The Prince of Wales continued to resist for the next half hour, 
but in the end it began to sink due to the amount of damage received. 513 men died aboard Repulse, while the Prince of Wales lost 327 sailors. The rest of their crews were rescued by the destroyers of Fort Zed. Imagine what if you, they didn't stay there for 90 more minutes. What if they just left? After seeing there's nothing wrong, just left. This wouldn't happen. I know, I know the war will not change, but this wouldn't happen. They still have, have the Prince of Wales and their poles. So yeah. Which managed to retreat to Singapore. The sinking of the British battleships was a heavy blow to the British Navy. Ah, but yes, it was I also forgot. a bad omen for the Malayan defenders and for the Chinese still resisting in the north. Meanwhile in Hong Kong, the Japanese commenced their attack across the Jin Drinkers Line on December 9th. At midday, Sakai's men detected a weak spot on the British line at the Xingmen Redoubt, quickly setting out to exploit it. By December 10th, the position had fallen into Japanese hands, and ah. the remaining defenders were now exposed. The following day, that's a, a that's failed a naval invasion on Lama Island at last forced Maltby to order his forces to withdraw back to Hong Kong Island, with the last of them crossing the Liamen Strait on the morning of December 13th. For the remainder of the week, Hong Kong would suffer a sustained bombardment while the Japanese planned their naval invasion. If you want more details about the struggles of this campaign, don't forget to check out our video on the Battle of Hong Kong. The link is in the top right corner. Okay. By December 10th, the Krokol detachment had also finally reached the town of Betong, being uh -huh. now only 26 miles away from their objective. They then started to traverse through the Patani River towards that the ledge, looks like it's an ambush. but were surprised by a Japanese ambush that forced them I to know. retreat when only a mile remained. See, that's a big problem. They, the plan was they have to get there quickly but they were stopped for two days so look what happened it turns out the regiment of the fifth division won the race to the ledge arriving there by midday on december 10th as a result the indians suffered heavy casualties and were eventually repelled back to crow by december 13th the rest of the fifth division had advanced southwards from singora to the malay border directly opposing Jitra and intending to take Alosita. Major General David Murray Leon of the 11th Indian Division, who had his forces in weak defensive positions at the road junction of Jitra, was not aware that the main objective of his defense, the Alosita airfield, had already been abandoned. Wow. From the coast, the 6th Indian Brigade defended a sector 10 miles long, while the 15th Indian Brigade held the road area Okay. and the 28th Indian Brigade was in reserve. The Indians had already sent two detachments to delay the Japanese advance on December 9th. But seeing the Japanese rapidly advancing, Murray Leon placed two battalions north of Jitra to give the Indian defences more time to be better prepared. This covering force came into contact with Japanese tanks on the morning of December 11th and was quickly overrun after suffering heavy casualties. The loss of these battalions forced Murray Leon to bring forward his reserves, leaving Alosita lightly defended. At night, the Japanese tanks reached the main British position north of Jitra, with the rest of the 5th Division coming behind. Heavy fighting ensued between the Japanese tanks and the demoralized Indian oh. troops, ending with the penetration of the British defenses around 0600. Several Indian forces were then overrun, prompting Murray Leon to repeatedly request permission to withdraw. At 1930, General Percival finally approved his request, and so the Indians began to retreat to a defensive position at Gurun. Okay. Due to very poor communications and amidst great confusion, Mar Look what happened, Murray Leon's mate. forces suffered immense casualties. So miscommunication can lead to failure or death yes and it's very very important if you're in a war you have to be well communicated with others but having miscommunicate that can lead to death or that can lead to a failure that can lead 
do anything bad. So yeah. But it can lead to good sometimes, but it's rarely. Very, very rarely. But managed to break out of contact with the Japanese by December 13th. As a result, the 11th Indian Division had been shattered, the main British defences in northern Malaya had been overrun, and the Japanese advance down the Malayan Peninsula had begun. Next time, we'll cover the remaining Japanese offensives of this week, mainly directed against the Philippines and the Pacific Islands, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing. So yeah guys, that's, that's very very interesting. Um, they still hadn't shown us how they, how Japanese just straight up conquered Malaysia, but it's very very interesting. And I'm very very excited for part 3 because, hold on, um, where was it? Because part 3 is Japan attacks everywhere simultaneously. And yeah, they're gonna attack everywhere. The Philippines. And oh, they had they didn't even invaded Malaysia. They still invaded Philippines before they invaded Malaysia fully. So yeah. I'm very very excited. Thank you for watching everybody. Like and subscribe for more videos like this. Goodbye. And go yeah. Check this video out in the description down below. Check Kingston Generals. Yeah. Bye-bye.